You're listening to a podcast from The Word. So here we are. Do you know how long we've been doing this, Mark? And I had a reminder of this this week by the miracle of Apple Photos, I think it is, that shows you old pictures uh, are taken on this date in years past that you've kept on your hard drive or whatever. And it had a picture of, of us recording uh, a podcast at Abbey Road. Uh, do you remember this? You remember? Going I remember that? that vividly. Yeah, it was, uh, it was Andrew Harrison, you, me, Matt Hall, and Kate Mossman, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we had the traditional picture taken going across the zebra, going across the great picture taken crossing. in the studio too, and we recorded the actual podcast in another studio there. And the reason we recorded that podcast uh, there was to, to celebrate our one hundredth podcast. Right? How long ago was and our one hundred? One hundredth podcast, Mark. This bears just stressing. Well, I, was it two thousand and eleven? No, when it's was it? Twelve years ago. That we years did ago. That we did our one hundredth. So, you know, people very often say, "How many have you done?" And strictly speaking, I don't really know how many we've done because, you know, we did it very uh, in the early days. We did it in a quite haphazard way, and then Matt Hall came along and said, "Matt said you've got to do it weekly," you know, which is very good advice, you know. Yeah, and we, we we'd largely done it weekly ever since, and so, but there's been odd changes of format, transfer from one host to the other, and so forth. So the actual number, I would not know. But let me tell you this: it's let me, hundreds. Let me many just, hundreds. Let me just say this to every every other wet behind the ears, <laughs> Ari Vist, Johnny no. come bloody lately, leaper, belated right. leaper on the podcast bandwagon. We were there before the yeah. lot of you. And then if you want proof, go and go and look. I know. Every day there's a kind of Rob Brydon started a podcast. Mate, can Mate, I catch you up? Tell me. It's Come just, on. Yes, absolutely. Where have so, you been? So I just thought I'd stress that. It's just worth it's worth talking about our, it is. our, our heritage. It's I'm worth, proud of it. And strength. I remember that podcast very well because Andrew Harrison tells the Van Morrison harmonica story. Oh, is it that very, one? very amusingly? It's a kind of <laughs> it's a kind of greatest hits performance. Yes, we just retell absolutely. stories that people it's really like, love. It's like Don McLean doing American Pie, isn't it? It is and Andrew Harrison it is. doing the Van Morrison. Yeah, do Van Morrison. Story. Yeah. Do some old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So talking of some old, something else that somebody sent me this week, um, and, you know, that people are all sending things from Whistle Test saying, do you, do you know you did this on Whistle Test? And we tend to say, I have no memory of it whatsoever. And then they send you the link and you see it. This is 1983. This is me introducing an item on Whistle Test about the apparent miracle of computerized music. You've you've seen this, haven't you? I've seen it because you, you're, you're, the, you're, the, you're there on the you're there at the end, I which see. reminded me that I was also, but I had absolutely no memory of it. And it may have been uh, no disrespect to your stunning presentational skills, <laughs> but it may have been the actual quality of the the item itself. Because no, I, I'll what, tell you, they didn't is, trust you to do it, Mark. They didn't trust you with machinery. No, they said, did quite no, rightly. Was, Presenter has got to be able to press the button here. Press and, the button, and, and you're doing uh, a live telly. And you're I, saying, I, just, I hope this works. I love that idea that it yeah. might not work. You know, but anyway, the point is, it's it, it's it, the, the two apparently miraculous records. One is a new single by Chris Seavey, and the other is a new record by Pete Shelley, Pete as, Shelley. A, as a solo performer. And in both cases, they they're miraculous. You know, hold on to your hats. A dazzling surprise that they're going to offer is that if you load the tape of this of these singles into your ZX Spectrum computer, total uh, memory twelve k. Okay, twelve k. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can somehow get it to read out the lyrics of this thing. Alongside playing the music, the lyrics come out as like a sort of ticker tape, don't and, it? and I have to say that as a piece of television, it is sensationally uninteresting. I absolutely but it is wrong. It's at the time it was probably pretty fascinating. It was, and I'll tell you why it was fascinating because it's come back to me because the prime mover behind this item was was the director of Whistle Test at the time, Tom Corcoran. Tom. And Tom, apart from his many other qualities, was a very early geek. He really was. He was. You know? he was. And in the days when it was BBC computers and, you, you know, only, only geniuses knew how to rig these things up. 
to get them to do very unremarkable things. And so he was the guy who wanted this to happen. He brought in a humongous great telly from yeah. home yeah. Okay, to line it up next to this, this computer and play these things together. I think he, I've got a recollection of doing something about CDs as well. The incredible new unbreakable format that will change the world, you know, and it, it made whistle test briefly feel like tomorrow's world. You know what I mean? it. It's as if you and I should have got out of our check shirts and put on white lab coats and uh, but, a, a but serious me, expression. But let me ask you this. You see, back then, we used to sort of believe in the future. We believed that there were, there were technological barriers and they would be, Approached at some point in in, in the future, uh, and you know things would would be delivered to you in different yeah. means and quicker and so forth. I don't think we believe that any longer, because we sort of think if technology is capable of doing something, it ought to be doing it right now. You know, and I can't sit here and think, how could the delivery of music, for instance, be better at some point in two years in the future than it is now? The only way people can think of it being better is if it goes back to, you know, vinyl and things like that. I don't think anybody's sitting here saying, wouldn't it be great to have music as a kind of implant or something like that? Quite. I, I don't or think they are. Couldn't we have it any faster? It's not immediate enough. You know, you can't, you know, absolutely everything you want, you can get straight away and with visuals. You know, it, 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 you're right. But the, th the thing about that that old bit of footage on the telly that reminded me, it, it, it made me think of how good, actually, the old whistle test things in the 70s were, when they used to think, how can we illustrate this song? And rather than just printed out lyrics, as, as we saw on that thing, you know, they had, uh, you know, Felix the Cat cartoons for Jefferson Starship and 20s flappers dancing to Trampled Underfoot by Led Zeppelin. Do you remember that? It used They're to really come, good. I know. I'll tell you where that stuff used to come from. It came from a company called Film Finders. Yeah which was run by Philip Jenkinson, who used to be one of the hosts of Late Night Lineup. Um, you, you'll have seen him on telly yeah. numerous times, who was a very serious film buff. And I think it was probably in the days, how can I put this diplomatically? I think it was in the days when um, it, multinational movie and media conglomerates did not have huge legal departments going around <laughs> issuing cease and desist orders. Saying, hang on, you stole a piece of our footage and put really? it in the old great whistle test, which they did, didn't they? Yeah, absolutely yeah. they did, you know. Yeah. And so the irony is that, that stuff, which was, which was put on in order to have a way of illustrating music when before people did videos, yeah. you couldn't show it any longer because you couldn't clear it any longer. Yeah. Whereas in those days, it was still sufficiently the Wild West for you to be able to get away with it. Yeah, oh, look, some Betty Boop footage. Let's Absolutely. stick that onto, you know, Van de Graaff generator. And also it Betty, works. Betty Boop is now is now officially too saucy to be on the television. In she is show. now, absolutely right. Because yeah. the, the animators used to, used to keep themselves amused, didn't they, by occasionally um, they, they'd insert a frame where she'd neglected to wear her, uh, her underwear. That's right. Um, which was which cool. now would they would people would freeze that frame and tweet it vigorously. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they, the, the director and general of the BBC upon the boop. The director general of the BBC would resign. He had to know. resign. He had to, first they had to apologise. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so then he'd be out. Further, oh, further variations on theme of uh, things aren't what they used to be. Uh, a, a friend was telling me the other day. He 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 runs a, a, a large um, the theatrical opera company. And when they do, traditionally, when they do, when they do dress rehearsals, they invite friends and family of the audience, uh, of the cast, come along. You know, it doesn't cost anything and so yeah. forth. And so traditionally what they do to defray some of the cost at the end is they go out with the old plastic bucket, you know, as people yeah. are ex exiting. Exiting, people are perfectly used to that, aren't they? And people chuck in a couple of quid or a fiver or whatever. And so at the end of the evening, you might end up with 300 quid or something, you know, and it's 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 worth doing. Of course, now we're in the cashless society. All you that's can't, gone. You can't do that anymore. And so what do they do, raise? Can you, you make you make an appeal and you say if you'd like to make a donation, you can do it online. 17 pounds fifty. 17 pounds 50 
as opposed to 300 pounds. And it just made me think, God, you know, the, the, the implications of the cashless society for all kinds that, of That's things. amazing. I, 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 and, and cash, there's something irreplaceably thrilling about it. I can remember Nick Lowe once telling me that there is absolutely no feeling to replace that of returning, this is a few years ago, returning from doing a gig with a ton in cash in your pocket. Oh, yeah. And it's true. You know, you get home and there's a brick of cash. You know, <laughs> the, and you just, you can just tear off great chunks of it and throw it at this and throw it we at that. Used to, it's a we, lovely feeling. We, we used to talk, uh, we used to work with an old ad man who used to talk about that having enough cash in his pocket uh, printers, particularly, yeah, Print, yeah. printers and cab drivers were always holding, folding, holding, as folding, Ron, as Ron used to say. And he said they've got a brick of cash big enough to choke, to a, choke donkey. a donkey. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, I know. I, you I know, forgot I, that. I, Rod still, I still think about that. But you're quite right. The thrill of cash, and of course, this is a huge thing in pop music. I've been putting together a compilation. Um, CD, multi CD thing, and and one of the one of the tracks on it is uh, is by the great Jesse Winchester, um, the opening track of his first album, which is called Payday, and it's I think the opening the opening couplet is Let's go out on the town tonight. My pockets, My pockets are heavy, heavy with, with loot. loot. That's heavy it. Yeah. with loot. <laughs> Isn't that loot's just... a great phrase? As if you somehow um, stole it in the first place. Oh you know? God! Oh, that's and, gorgeous. And uh, you know, and of course, if you go back further, you got the Easy Beats Friday on my mind. Yeah. You know, which we all remember. You know, tonight I'll spend my bread. Tonight I'll lose, I'll my, lose head. my head. Tonight, the, that's right. The yeah. idea is on Thursday you had nothing. Yeah. On Friday you've got everything, and on Saturday you'll probably have nothing. You'll have in nothing again. again. Because that's the way it but works. But it's about it's about very small sums of money comparatively. It's about enough money. It's not it's not life changing. It's that it's it's day changing, isn't it? It's, it's enough money to get absolutely. you absolutely plastered and uh, and get a huge hangover and, at the and end impress of it. a girl and um, impress a girl exactly. And, uh, whereas you know hip hop is hugely you know he talks about cash a lot. You know, I've got to get paid, all that kind kind of thing. But what it, that is talking about is it is enormous sums, yeah, yeah. isn't it? Of, yeah. of life changing, if you were sensible, <laughs> but probably not. Um, yeah. You know, that, that's talking about tens of thousands of dollars, isn't it? It Rather is. Rather than enough to get through through the weekend. But I and, love the feeling that in so many songs back in the day, you got that very physical feeling of the the texture and the, almost the touch of 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 of, uh, of money. You know, do you remember all the folk songs about the greenback dollar? And oh, there's all those mentions of bills and bucks and nickels and lousy dimes. Yeah, yeah. There's a great in Stormy Monday. There's a great line. It goes, uh, "The eagle flies on Friday, and Saturday, Saturday I go out to play." Because there's an eagle on the back of a, of a probably still is. is there a oh, is that? Bit? Yeah, Why? the eagle. The eagle flies on Friday. It means, it means I, I get need, cash. I did yeah. not know that. The eagle, there, which means I'm going to take off because I've got the money to be able to fly with. It's fantastic. Oh wow! And well, it's a, like, but, what was that? Who did? It's all about the Benjamins. Oh uh, yeah, it was, it was uh, Benjamin, Puff Daddy, wasn't it? Yeah, Benjamin Franklin's on a hundred dollar note. Yeah, I think. that's um, right. Um, the and dead they, presidents, but he wasn't a president, Benjamin Franklin. No. Was, you know, and there's a there is a great <laughs> Sorry, there's a great history hip-hop. lesson. Though. Oh yeah, there was a great hip hop song that Seventies Johnson used to play in the Word Office called uh, "Turn My Swag On" by Soldier Boy, which is about making huge amounts of money. It's bling. It's about kind of dressing up and making money. And he has a great line. That he says, "I'll be making paper like you wouldn't believe." That's a lovely line. Too. Oh, making yeah. paper. That's holy fun. And the other thing about cash is you can. The sound of it, the genius of money yeah. by the Pink Floyd, is the sound of the cash deals. It is. The genius of money in cabaret is, um, you know, a mark, a yen, a buck or a pound, the clinking, clanking clinking sound. sound. That's fantastic, I think. You you cannot get that sensation, Dave, from a bank transfer. Can you? I don't know, maybe. (laughs) Has anybody? So there's there's a challenge to the massive. Has anybody written recently a song that reflects the modern ways of, of people getting compensated or paying for things, you know, which are, you know, Hold your phone over the uh, over the, the swipe machine or whatever you know. Um, I'd be interested to see if anybody's done it. Do you remember? You must have had jobs where you were paid in cash weekly. Yeah, and they used to turn up and they give you the cash, 
and they had these beautiful envelopes. And they envelopes. had a little sort of bit with holes in it. They had you a could window see through. That's they right. A, they had a window, and, and they would lay out the notes, the different denominations of notes, in such a way that I found them out. Yeah, you could see you them could all. Count how many ones or how many fives yeah. were in there. And then the coins would be visible below because the idea is you could count it without breaking the seal. Without breaking the seal. And, uh, and if I, not- I worked in a tractor factory uh, when I left school for uh, about three or four months. And I can, I can still I can remember on Fridays you got your wage packet. You remember that in a Brahmin or on exactly the envelope you're talking about? Yeah. I can even remember what it was. It was £23.40 for a week. And that was just no. seemed a massive amount. Oh, Ridiculous. God. Yeah. And when you, when you did overtime, so couple of weeks later you get significantly more yeah you know, that was just unbelievably thrilling you know? but that's another thought isn't it? it's all about the idea that you saved up to buy a record or whatever oh you, know, you physically saved up uh you know the, 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 you you'd actually put money aside I, I, and i love that idea i remember going to stay with john peel once when we were at word we just started word and i was doing an interview and i stayed overnight at his house and he had a little jar for two pound coins in the kitchen and there everybody put the two pound coins and when there was enough they all went out and had a pizza i thought that's such a lovely idea and i wonder if people still do that i don't know no no probably not because you don't don't have two pound coins you You probably if you're like me you've probably got in your house somewhere a jar that contains coins yeah that you put in there last february oh right and you have you haven't there you go Here's, here's one with foreign currency in it, yeah, which is just completely useless. I mean, really. yeah, yeah, absolutely. It'll be useless even when uh, even when we can all go out. I know. Now, now, just while we're dealing with important issues, what's the most stupid two words anybody can ever put on an album cover? I'm going to tell go you. On. Go on. The most stupid, stupid two words, and they, they appear on loads of album covers. Play loud. Oh, yeah, play, play loud. loud. Oh, I quite like that. What? 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 Is that? Well, somebody had an album. Was it Slade had a record called "Play Play Play It Loud" or something? Was that the second album? Oh Slade? no, I don't it's know. It's on a Stones album. It's on "Let It Bleed," I think it says. It, uh, it is. So this record should be played like oh, I like that idea. I mean, this let's get the party started. Let's kick off. I found this. I found that I was looking at the issue. The reason I was thinking of that I found this yesterday. Prefab Sprout, Steve Mc, Steve McQueen. Sure, that didn't say "Play Loud," did it? There you go. You're it kidding does. me. It says, due to the exceptional length of this record, play loud. Now that's well, it doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't make any sense at all. Because all you if you're gonna play it louder and it's you know, its signal isn't isn't that high, all you're gonna hear is more surface noise, aren't you? Yeah. You know, you're not gonna hear any more of the sprout, they're hardly that's incredible. Do they have that on everything but the girl records? Can I buy a, a young marble giant album with play loud? Play quiet. Get out Newsome. There's probably, I don't know. Has anybody ever put a record out called Play Quiet? You know, that, uh, and also it's subjective. You know, we, we make the judgment ourselves, can't we, as to whether can. something needs to be turned up or not. No, it's up to us. But I still like the idea that it means there's a party <laughs> waiting to be had here, so get involved. Okay. The Word Podcast, prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. Somebody sent uh, me a picture this week of um, of somebody in Sydney, Australia, who who was celebrating their fiftieth birthday, uh, and they de- decorated the back the back yard with the kind of livery of my nineteen seventy one book. They Aww. they painted nineteen seventy one all over their their garage door. It's absolutely oh, it's, that's it's, so it's very nice. gratifying. So, that's really touching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'd love to see that. So I'll, I'll send it to you later. So yeah, 50, yeah. 50 years ago, uh, 50 years ago, r- round about this week, was it Johnny Mitchell's Blue came out? Yeah, almost exactly this week. I think it's about, just about a week's time. I know. God, I can remember that coming out. God, that was that was a big deal, wasn't it? I, do, I, 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 I mean, I'll Maybe it wasn't a big I, deal uh, instantly. You no, I don't think it, it was been. instantly. You know, because my God. You, you put out records quite quite frequently in those days added as did many people in those days you know so there was less there was less fanfare about each individual one you know but uh, i was just looking at the original uh, review in rolling oh, stone by, oh, this by is Tim, good. timothy kraus and um and he he says he's kind of generally appreciative but but you know, it's 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 very much you know he's only just heard it kind of thing. You know, he hasn't lived with it or anything like that. 
and he certainly does it. He certainly doesn't herald it as as, as if it is. One of the greatest records of all time, which, of course, nowadays it gets into loads of people's lists, you know, of those kind of things. But it's interesting that uh, he says that uh, there are certain songs you just can't work out what they're about at all. He says, Little well, Green. Little Green will be one of them, yeah. He says, dressed up in such crypt- cryptic references, it path- passes all understanding. Well, we didn't know for, what, 20 <laughs> years, did we? Because Little Green not. was about the birth of her, well, she gave up her daughter for adoption, I think, in 1965. And I think she reunited with her 30 years later. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah, she had not. And by yeah. the time they'd actually met, they'd make, by the time they met, I think her daughter had become a, a, a mother too. So she became a mother and a grandmother but overnight. Yeah. And, and interesting her, pop fact: her, her own her mother career. was her own mother was still alive. Yes, that's right. So that's there, was right. A, there was suddenly four generations. I know, incredible. I yeah, and, and interestingly, she sort of, I think, at that point, stopped. She put out. Uh, she said put that. out an album. Of, there was an album she'd been working on. I forgot what it's called. I think it's called "Taming of the Tiger." She then put out the orchestral reworkings of her songs. There was one more album, I think, in two thousand and seven, slightly half-hearted, and she kind of retired. <laughs> So maybe that had some kind of effect on it. I think, I think she done. said this, actually. Yeah. I think she's admitted, you know, saying this, that, yeah. uh, that it made it made such a difference to her life that she, that the kind of, the creative urge was a, was a form of compensation. Absolutely. In the, in the 70s and the, yeah. in the 80s, uh, you know, but it's, uh, and but I, I, I do, that. I do think it's really interesting that, that, uh, it's one of those records we people often say. Well, I think she said herself it was, it was like an X-ray. You know, I, 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 I had no personal. Well, she did say this. I had no personal defences. I felt like a cellophane wrapper on a pack of cigarettes. I felt like I had absolutely no secret from the world, and I couldn't pretend in my life to be strong or to be happy. And but of course, she wrote that song, "Little Green," and nobody knew what it was about. No, uh, and now, now that we know, you you you've got a, a far clear. You've got a, you know, it has a reality that other songs don't have, because you know it's it's the literal truth, isn't it? You know yeah. about about what must have been a, a terrible wrenching you know incident in our life, whereas the other songs. They could be about James Taylor. They could be about David Blue. They could be about Graham Nash. You don't really know. You know, you can apply them if you want. But it's just interesting. You know, we always think we can tell things about people's lives from, from the songs on their records. And I don't really know whether you can because they're just songs, aren't they? You know, they're just, they're just compositions. And, 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 you know, whatever scans or whatever makes a good title or whatever is more important than whether it's the literal truth about but the difference this. between her because there were people at the time you thought you knew a bit about i mean leonard cohen you know he did nancy and uh, suzanne and marianne you know the people that he he, he who were in his world seem so exotic and fabulous but there's no actual detail about that like there's a little bit in paul simon songs america's a really good example where they're on the they're on the Greyhound buff, you know, and the, you know, you, you know, the, the, the his, his tie is really a camera, and the man in the gabardine, gabardine coat is a spy, and all that. You can imagine that kind of world that they'd inhabit, and you wanted to have those kind of conversations yourself. But the thing about Joni Mitchell was that there's lots of details in those songs that really make them come alive and make them possible to picture. They're like plays, I think. You uh-huh. know what I mean? The last time I saw Richard, it was a kind of a conversation. But there's been, the barmaid came by and fishnet stockings and a bow tie and said, drink up now, it's getting on time to close. Those are brilliant, brilliant, brilliant just, just details. My fingernails are filthy. I've got beach tar on my feet. I'm going to rent a grand piano and put flowers around the room. You know, the clean white linen, the fancy French cologne. You, I think you've got a real idea of the fabric lo- of her life. I know? love I love, I love, love the references. and She does it in loads of her records. To the clean white linen. And yeah. Like that. It's always the, the thing about Jane Mitchell, she's never made any secret about the fact she loves luxury. Yeah. You know, me, I play for fortunes and the, That's right. the curtain calls and all that kind of thing. Yeah. She likes the fancy life. She likes the five star life because she lived the other kind of life as well. She did. And she doesn't want to make any pretense about it at all. And it's a, it's a real addition to the song. I've just, I've just realized I wrote down. 
a really bad couplet from Blue. And I'm going to, I've written on a piece of paper over there. I'm going to go and find Don't it. Don't get it. I can't believe, minute. I can't believe there's a bad couplet on Blue. There are a lot of good ones. My old man's got some lovely lyrics in it. The bed's too big, the frying pan's too wide. Those are just fantastic images, I think, that everyone can relate to. It's so good. Go, go, tell us the bad couplet. Oh, God, what did I write it down? Oh, there we go. Uh, I think it's on California. Okay, defend this, Mark Ellen. <laughs> I'm going to see the folks I dig. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll even I'll kiss, kiss, kiss the sunset, sunset pig. pig. That's poor. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Joni. That's, That's poor. poor. No, that is. There are some good others. One about going say, to a party, going to Spain. You go to a party on a, uh, down a, a, a dirt uh, track road or something. And lots of pretty people there reading Rolling Stone, reading Vogue. That's yes. a fantastic line. I love that. The idea that, you know, what you go to these outposts, the one in America is leading the way. With the what do you, what do you think about applause, applause, life is our cause. When I feel your kisses, my mind Seesaws. 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 But she gets away with it. She gets Just away about. with it because of the way she does it, you know. But I uh, can't think of a of another musician that you felt you knew as much about. You're probably right. I mean, it's, it probably was utterly fictional, but you had a very clear life of the uh, view of the, of the world she inhabited and felt incredibly strong bond towards it. I mean, I can remember going with my girlfriend to uh, Crete in whatever it would be in 74 and going to Matala. Why? Because she had been to Matala in uh, one of her songs uh, and had hung around in the caves, the beach tower on my feet. The wind is in from Africa. I mean, that's that's how powerful a pull it was on me. The wind is in from Africa is a wonderful opening. Yeah, last songs. night I couldn't sleep. It's, it's fantastic. fantastic. Oh. But I don't think, you know, I'm not sure whether these things are all literal, literally true. It's just that, that people, they, they mine their own lives, don't yeah. they, for, for ideas. And then they put them alongside other ideas and uh you know it's like you know it, you know what's that old line about when a writer enters a family the family is no more because they oh, right. take they, they take, take and expose absolutely everything you know all and columnists say, say that don't they yeah, everything yeah. is raw material everything everything is raw yeah material. yeah yeah so yeah so 50 years ago uh this week and if, if you haven't got it well go and get it can't get it. Johnny Mitchell's blue. Um, also, nine seventy one. That fantastic clip that you sent me. That someone has sent you right, of that yes. group. Oh my god, it's so. Sweet. Oh, I've got to find this. I've so got the to find story is, them. if I remember right, the story is, is a group was called Kinky Machine, and Kinky Machine played their farewell concert at the Woodville Halls in Gravesend. In 1971. And what they've done, and this has happened quite a bit during lockdown, is that the remaining members of Kinky Machine, who I think is all of them, possibly apart from the drummer, um, who are spread out all over the world now, have reunited and made this little video. They've written a new song, and it's a lovely little self explanatory song that sort of talks about their old life in 1971 in Gravesend, and also their new, new life now, you know. And they're very sweet. They, they formed in a place called the Telly T Bar. Yeah. Which they said, an unprepossessing cafe with a jukebox playing all right now and later, alternatively, until plug, unplugged. <laughs> and, uh, and and the whole thing is about looking back on the old um, haunts, isn't it? There was a pub called the Borough Shades and the pub called the Prince of Orange. And they had little pictures of them, what they look like now. The details are amazing, what they look like now and what they look like then. It's fantastic. It is fantastic. It's where we'll, we'll post it, actually. Uh, say it's really worth seeing. And it was Keith Peacock that sent that uh, to us. And they're a really nice bunch of uh, really well-preserved, cheerful blokes. <laughs> there they are with their lovely wives. Some of the, I think some of the wives might have been in the band too, actually. I tell you well they reminded me of, actually, if we were on a bit of a hippie trip. They reminded me of a group called Global Village Trucking Company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and they sound very like them, you know, who had that kind of Ian Dury kind of what went on to be kind of like madness, that kind of sort of upbeat, umpa kind of musical vibe about them. And uh, Global Village Trucking Company had been going in 1970. I, I saw them in 1974, I remember, in Oxford. And they reformed not long ago. And I love that. And the, <laughs> and the interesting pop fact about the, the, the Global Village Trucking Company was there was a rumour that the keyboard player, James Lascelles, was the second son of the seventh Earl of Harewood and also the stepson of Jeremy Thorpe. Well, and it yeah, turned yeah. out in real yes. life... That actually he was the second son of the seventh Earl of Harewood, 
and yes, was, was the stepson of Jeremy Thorpe because his mum went on to marry each other. Yeah, yeah. And he was the first cousin once removed to the Queen of Elizabeth the second, and in line to the succession to the British throne. So that is pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. All those things were true. People would go, they'd come on stage and go, oh, it's Jeremy Thorpe's son, or, you know, he's, he's in line he, He's in line to be the King of England. He'd go, get off, you know. Turns out... He was. That would have been really good because uh, Pete Frame could have done a family tree which had the Global Village Trucking Company on one side and the kind of House of Hanover. Prince Philip on the other. That's right, yeah. It just go on forever. That's brilliant. Well. I I wonder if there was a posher person in rock. I doubt it, actually. That's terrific, isn't it? If you know a posher person in rock, please get in touch. This is a junction in the Word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. Any other business? We're joined by Alex Gold. How are you doing, Alex? My God, you've got a lot of hair, haven't you? Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, definitely, it's definitely going south at a rapid rate. Um, it's good. I'm going to be chopping we like it off it. in the next couple of months, though, I think. I'm actually thinking about, seriously thinking about um, keeping it when it's being cut and getting it fashioned into um, my next John Lennon wig. <laughs> oh, a wig made out of your own hair. That'd yeah, be amazing. Oh. Sort of, isn't it? I quite like the idea of that. No God, being that's... That's bizarre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it really, you are very, it's very Abbey Road now, isn't it? Actually. It is, it is. Same it's colour, actually, that, everything. That's true, actually. Yeah, it's, it's just go on. on. Let's have a look at your profile as if you're walking across the zebra. Oh, it is, it's well, good. God, it, it is works. good. It's if you've got a white suit, Alex, you got a white, white suit, suit put your hands in your pockets and pair of gym cross, shoes. Cross, well, I've, got, I've, got it, I've got it all in my cupboard over there. That's the thing. But this is, this is actually better than my John Lennon circa 1969 wig. Very it's good. really got me thinking. <laughs> talking um, to the Beatles, talking to the Beatles. John Dredge, um, who sent me, uh, uh, he found an old ad for Bassett's Jelly Babies from presumably the, the 1960s. And uh, the copy goes, we name no names, but a certain pop group is believed to rate Jelly Babies top of the sweet parade, blah, 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 blah. And, of course, well, you don't remember, Alex, because clearly you weren't there, but we do remember that we during do. the height of Beatlemania, Girls used to pelt the Beatles with jelly babies because they'd once said in an interview that they liked jelly babies or one of them had or whatever. And they used to, after a while, they complained about this. And it's only now when I look at that ad that John sent in, I thought, I'm not surprised they... Can you they, imagine? What must it have been like? It's got a smart, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> A, a handful of jelly babies raining down like shrapnel from the from the gallery. And God I mean, they're, they're heavy as well, aren't they, yeah, jelly yeah, babies? Yeah. You know, with smarties, not so much of a problem. But a jelly baby catching you on the forehead, you'd, you'd, you'd know it, about it, wouldn't you? A, a jelly baby's quite dense. You know, the, the yeah. it's exterior belies its density. So I imagine there's a projectile. <laughs> it, it, there's yeah. a lot of purchase in a jelly baby. Well, thanks for that, John. Uh, we've also another feedback from... Uh, from uh, patrons and uh, and friends, Chuck Lonson in um, in Savannah, Georgia, sends this. He wants to know uh, how many original members must take part in a concert or album in order for it to be really considered that particular band. The Stones are down to three original members. Yes, uh, could just Keith and Mick carry on as the Stones? Would Ringo and Paul be the Beatles? Could just Paul and John have been the Beatles? Pete and Roger are still the Who. Could it have been Daltrey and Entwistle? You know, which individual's participation is so integral that losing one person ends the band, no matter how many originals remain? It's a good point. Well put, Chuck. Um, Very good point. But but McCartney and Ringo as the Beatles would be a riot. Yeah, oh they would be a riot. God, the Beatles, Beatles would go. Be a, I mean, it would sell less tickets than McCartney on his own. Yeah, or Ringo on his own. Beatles, actually. different case. I think totally we've got to different say case. different case. Four and two have gone. You know, I don't know. I think um, if you have a writer or writers in the group, you'd have to have those writers present to to make it feel like it was the group. Right. I don't so, think you could have the Who without Townsend, for example. I could really you have? Well, if you had the Who without Townsend right now, it would be a Roger Daltrey show, wouldn't it? It yeah. would. Literally. <laughs> so, <laughs> God forbid. You, know, you couldn't have Roger you couldn't Daltrey. Have the, you couldn't have the Kings without Ray Davis. You probably no. couldn't have. You probably couldn't have Oasis without Liam Gallagher. Actually, although clearly Noel sings some of the songs. He just doesn't sing. You couldn't have the Pretenders without Chrissy Hine. Sting, n- not in the Police. That no, doesn't really work. Really. No, it doesn't. Mind work. you, there are groups who've carried on without the lead singers, aren't they? Stranglers did all right, didn't they? The Undertones. 
Gang of Four at the very end was just one member of Gang of Four who was the guitar player who never sung, Andy Gill. So and the Gang of Four was one, was it? One member of the Gang of Four <laughs> who was not a singer. They were still called the Gang of Four. That's amazing, isn't it? I, that's a different level, isn't it? Because it is. If you're a Gang of Four fan, you kind of know what you're getting, don't you? Yeah. You, you're yeah, buying into the concept of the Gang of Four. It's you the are. Of the band. Whereas out of the the Who or whatever, that's, that's the Who without Pete Townsend. That would feel like selling tickets under false pretenses. It would really would do. It would. Um, but yeah, like the Clash it. reforming now with no Joe Strummer would be just utterly wrong. Although it? Did, 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 the Cl- did the Clash do anything without Joe Strummer? They nearly did. I'm pretty sure so. they nearly I thought they re- did. No, yeah. no, I'm pretty sure they nearly reformed for. I think it was a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame thing with Bruce Springsteen um, taking the strummer position. Oh, yeah. well, that's 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 got a value all of his own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has. That's uh, that's that's got kind of, a bit of a magnetic that's, pull. That's improved there. actually. But, yeah. yeah. No, but the logic was apparently that strummer it is the closest thing to being. Uh, sorry, Springsteen's the closest thing to being Joe Strummer's counterpart in in terms of what he stands for and, all right, and right, everything like right. that. So. Yeah, I could live with that. Well, but but you know, there's um, there was a time when the concept of Marillion without fish was inconceivable, but they've had they've no both had very for, good careers, haven't they? They've had no fish for absolutely years now. You probably you probably just have to go out and prove it all again, don't you? Really, is the truth. You've got to get through that point where people go, no, actually, the new blokes really good. Yeah, you know, they're they're actually better with this person. You sort of have to do that before people will accept it. But there's, I think the answer to your question is, Chuck, there's no hard and fast rule, really. This debate will no doubt case run Case by around. case issue. It's a case by case. Yeah. And we'll, we'll set ourselves up as consultants, you know, for a, <laughs> for a fee. We will tell you if your proposed lineup of your reformed group is taking money under false pretenses or not. Shall we do that? Uh, I, I asked if anybody had any um, any questions to put to the jury, uh, and uh, you know, while we were doing this podcast, and somebody asked, "Who was it?" Um, Brian Cannon, uh, Brian Cannon Hunter. Which film have you watched the most times? Because we were talking about this only the other day, weren't we? That there are certain films that you just watch. Is that a, music, a music, a music film, or just a film? No, it's any film. I think I'm sure it's just any film. I'll go first. I, uh, and the t- acid test of this is, if you're walking through the living room and these films are on the television, do you sit down first of all on the edge of a sofa, pretending you're only going to be there for a little while, and then after a while you slip down into the main body of the sofa? And uh, you're clearly there until the end of the film. And and I, I I'm a sucker for certain things. If if any Ealing comedy is on the television as I'm going through the room, I sit down straight away. You know, yeah, absolutely anything made in Ealing. You know, and uh, Lady the, Killers, fantastic. The, the the Lady Killers, anything anything like that. But also more recently, the film that I watched again and again and again. Uh, and I absolutely love is Master and Commander, the I've uh, seen that. Russell Crowe, uh, Peter Weir film uh, based on the Patrick O'Brien books. I think it's a fantastic film that, and it's it's just I also forget loads of the plot, which is a, quite a strength in a film when you go back to it. Think you're you're reintroduced to things. You think, oh yes, of course that happens, and then that happens. There's so that. many episodes. There's the there's there's the bit where they get becalmed and their, oh. their kind of mental state becomes begins to unravel. I mean, it's absolutely great. and the Galapagos. Galapagos, uh, they have to uh, abandon all the creatures. Yeah, and, right. and the drama at the beginning. And ah, oh, I think I think it's such a good film. And yeah, if you haven't seen it, go and see it. But also something else, <laughs> which I don't think is a, a, a particularly work of genius or anything like that. But I've watched it loads of times. And I actually sent you, I, I nudged you on it the other day. I said, this is on the BBC iPlayer. Go and watch it. Which is Margin Call, the the film about, uh, you know, thinly disguised uh, version of the kind of Bearings Bank type collapse 
uh, set in it's the, the financial. Uh, it's two thousand and eight, New York, isn't it? Is yeah. a, I think it's a really, really fantastic good film. The new thing, really powerful drama. It's extraordinary. And that's, and that's again, that's just a play. It's just brilliant dialogue, all taking place as their whole world starts to fall apart. They realise that they've uh, that, that, that they're headed for a financial catastrophe. It's just brilliant. Stars Great Kevin, Kevin Spacey, uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Irons. Irons, yeah, uh, uh, Paul Bettany. It's a really, really good. Uh, I'd recommend that. What about you, Mark? Well, I would have to just add to that uh, Some Like It Hot. I'm sorry, I can't think how many times I've seen Some Like It Hot. I can't resist it. It's wonderful. I know it has no great hidden depths or anything like that, but there's something incredibly funny and cheering and optimistic and knockabout and beautiful about the whole thing. Just the the, the story that the, the two the Jack Lemon and Tony Curtis, their 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 acting abilities, playing their parts in drag, you know, every the lines. I think it's gorgeous. It's fantastic. Also, but, they're not they're not making that kind of film anymore. No, they're not. I mean, that's the other thing, you know. So often. Yeah, my television, I don't know if it's something that something to do with the way I use it, but when I turn it on, it opens on, not on BBC One, it opens on Talking Pictures TV. It just does. It defaults to Talking Pictures TV, which is the channel that just runs old movies from the 40s and the 50s and the 60s or whatever, because I clearly just watch so much of that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I, wish that, I wish there were more channels like that. What about you, Alex? The only film I've ever watched so much that I could recite the whole thing from start to finish and did was the um, was the 1986 animated Transformers movie cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> I used to watch it on a daily basis, and I could I could recite the whole thing from start to finish. So what's the, what's the opening line then, Alex? Oh, I couldn't remember that now. God damn it. Um, <laughs> Probably, probably something like Transform, but um, oh, right, right. at the time. We went on a holiday once when our kids were, uh, I think they were about 13 and 11, and they could recite the entire script of uh, Austin Powers. Oh, wow. And playing three or four parts each, and, uh, you know, Dr. Evil and uh, the, the, uh, the, the Liz Hurley part and all that. It was so funny, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, you can, can't you? You can memorise the entire thing if you've seen it enough. Yeah. I wish now, here, here's a challenging question from Matt Penny. Here's a nice cheery thought. Would you rather live without books or live without music? Mm. Ooh, God. Ooh. Well, it's easier to remind yourself of music because it's in your head. Yes. You can just replay records because they're so familiar. You can't replay books. You know, you reread a book and you're just your toes curl up with delight at the at the phraseology of a certain paragraph. So I think probably the answer is I've got enough music in my head. I don't know, really. Yeah, Difficult. Well, I'm going to go a little bit esoteric here and say that all the music you need is is within you already. Hey, so, I think there's a lot of truth. Man. Yeah, there's a lot of truth. Um, which another another question? Uh, I've forgotten who this came from. Um, somebody was asking. You know what? 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 What's the record that you you reach for when you're in a bad mood to calm you? Somebody said, "Oh, it's Billy Hush." But John Peel once said that when he's in a foul mood, he would play Jimmy Reed records to calm down. Do you have a go-to artist or album when the red mist descends? His his is Dusty in Memphis. Um, while you're thinking, Dusty's uh, a good choice. Dusty's a very good choice. Yes. Um, not so much a specific record, but a specific kind of record. Scar, any kind of scar, always lightens your mood. That's true. We often play an album yes. called Intensified, which is absolutely wonderful. Do you know that compilation? Yeah, yeah. It's got the original version of uh, The Higher the Monkey Climbs and songs like that. It's, it's, yeah, there is something utterly reassuring and comforting about Scar. Yeah, it just lifts you. What about you, Alex? Um, it's either... Everything is awesome. The Lego song, which is uh, <laughs> unfailingly cheerful. <laughs> or go on. Probably, what's the story? Morning Glory. Oh, I do. Uh, okay. Never going to be too far away. From yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> okay. Well, they're all all worthwhile suggestions. Uh, any other business we got to talk about? Uh, if you haven't got your tickets already for July seventeenth. Uh, in uh, in Holland Park, do so. 
You can say excitement is building as we get nearer. Uh, we'd like to say Barney Hoskins is now added to our to our list of raconteurs speakers on the day, in addition to Leslie Ann Jones and Gary Crowley. More to, more be to come. More to be announced in due course. Uh, but please, where should people go and look if they want to book tickets, Alex? They can go straight to wiylondon.com. There's a, there's a ticket widget on the on the front page of the website, so nice and easy. I'm going to finish with a, a sad story. Um, I, I bought this. This is the Mirror and the Light, Hillary Mantel. This is the third. It's pretty thick. Good the God. third The third part of her a trilogy about Thomas Cromwell, okay? And it's all kind of engrossing stuff and so forth. But this morning, I just got to got to page 624, okay? There's page 624. There's page 625. It's blank. Oh, my Lord. It's blank. How do I feel about that? I'll tell you how I feel. Cross. You know, it's the missing page. It's Tony Hancock. Oh, it's that's Darcy Sarto, the lady don't fall backwards. All those things. So and it's get... not a joke as it was in the, in the Diary of a Nobody when there is a blank page, isn't it? Because it's his thoughts. Do you remember? <laughs> that's, that's, not... that's just terrible. Though. That's just ridiculous. And, and my wife says, well, of course, you can take it back. I said, well, yes, I can. But, you know, A, it's a, it's a pain in the backside. And B, here's the point. When you've got three quarters of the way through a very very thick book do you want it replaced by a new one i'm no, you saying no you what don't. you're going to do is go to a bookshop look up page 627 of uh, a fresh copy read it memorize it and then run out or photograph it possibly <laughs> <laughs> stick it back on the shelf and leg it but i'm saying it's the kind of problem you did not have to put up with really no, that's a it's the kind of thing up with which we will not put if this gets back to Hillary Mantel, there'll be a, a lorry will turn up outside your house and just offload, you know, pallets full of her books. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I need more. Hillary yes, Mantel. brick-like tone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we shall see. This podcast was brought to you by The Word. Hey.